Um, I'm, I'm walking, so I wanted to film the lightning. Uh, and now the lightning and the thunder, at least, is certainly right above. Ooh. Thanks, Doug. Well, first up, we have the amazing description of a new genus and species of late Jurassic pterosaur from Germany, the utterly bizarre and wonderful Belenognathus malzrai. This animal is based on a remarkably complete fossil with almost all of the bones preserved, including its jaws, which are filled with at least 480 individual teeth. Not only does it have a huge number of teeth, but it has a snout that widens out into a spatula-like structure with no teeth present at the front interpreted as enabling this pterosaur to filter feed, with plankton-rich water streaming into its jaws through this toothless gap and then filtering out through the many teeth. Indeed, it's classified as a tenochasmatid pterosaur, a lineage of probably filter-feeding pterosaurs including pteridaustra with its bristle-like teeth, and is now the oldest confirmed member of this grouping. It's an absolutely amazing discovery, and recently I, along with the Bonehead's crew, were fortunate enough to get an interview with the lead author of the paper describing this pterosaur, Professor Dave Martill who explained why this animal is quite so important. Welcome to uh, this interview with Professor Dave Martill, lead author of um, this new pterosaur paper. Uh, and we just have quite a few questions for you about this amazing new species that you've described. Um, so how did you first come across this specimen? I very first saw photographs of the specimen when I was taking Portsmouth students on a field trip to Germany. And um, I, I have a friend, Helmut Tischlinger, who I've worked with for many years. And I was at his house one evening while the students were down at the pub. And he showed me some photographs of an absolutely wonderful new pterosaur. And at that time it was under wraps. Um, I was just delighted to be able to see it, but I was told to keep it a massive secret and in fact pretend I hadn't seen it. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely gorgeous. And then a couple of years passed and um, I got invited to work on it, which was an absolute delight because believe me, this is one of the most wonderfully preserved pterosaurs I've ever seen in uh, 30 years of studying these things. Uh, and of course I, I jumped at the opportunity and straight away uh, went over to Germany to, to, to work on this thing and visit the locality where it came from and uh, get stuck in. Yeah, so Bellino, so Bellino Gnathus, is that how you pronounce it? Bellino Gnathus, yeah. The, the baleen is from a baleen whale, so the name effectively means whale jaw. And the reason that we named it after a whale jaw is because it has an array of very, very fine teeth that formed a filter along the whole length of the jaw, much in the way as the baleen plates of the big cetaceans. It's quite clear that it was taking in water rich in very, very fine food particles and somehow filtering out over the teeth. So there's a, a big long jaw, comes along like this, lined with teeth, it widens open, Y-shaped, and then there are no teeth. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that this open-ended part of the jaw acts as a funnel, and water would be uh, brought in along the jaws and then squeezed out over this array of very, very finely interlocking teeth. Uh, how do you get the water in? Well, the animal presumably either moved through the water, mm -hmm. walking upstream perhaps, or passively sat in a current and simply let water flow into the mouth. You could imagine that in a tidal flat, when the tide is falling, water is often at a pace coming down little creeks and things, and you could sit there and just passively filter feed. Yeah. What you have to do though, of course, is you have to squeeze the water out over the, uh, the, the dental battery. And so what we think is that the, the shape of the lower jaw, sort of kind of like V-shaped, fitted into a cavity in the upper jaw. And if the uh, animal was dabbling like a duck doing this, yeah. it would act as a pump. So if you had water pressure coming in, filling the buccal cavity with water laden with you know, small fairy shrimps or ostracods or what have you. If it then kept doing this, an oscillation with the jaws, that would, provided the pressure wasn't too high, squeeze the water back out the front end again, it would squeeze the water through the gaps in the teeth. All the tiny particulate material would then get caught upon the teeth. And the cool thing is that these teeth have got a little hook at the end, which would also help catch small prey. And then it just need a big lick with the tongue and 
back down the gullet goes the goes the food material. Well, that's a brilliant yeah. point yeah. because it well, yeah. it's literally the next question was what are the hooked ends of the tooth for? But that was a brilliant point. Well, that's that's what we think. But I mean, these are unique. I mean, pterosaur teeth are usually fairly simple. These are from um, an ornithochyrid from the Cretaceous. But effectively, the majority of Jurassic and uh, Cretaceous pterosaur teeth look a little bit like this. There's a little bit of variation. Some are more triangular, uh, but effectively they look like this. And the one thing they don't have is a hook at the end. In fact, it's very rare across the whole of the animal kingdom to find a hook on the end of a tooth. Um, the nearest thing we could find when we were looking uh, across the whole range of animals was crab eater seals. And they have a hook on the ends of some of the lobes, but their teeth are completely different. They certainly don't look like long, slender things yeah. like, like these. So they are a bit, bit of a mystery, uh, and it's probably uh, time that we actually did some modeling to see how they would perform uh, as filters. Uh, so, so it's a very, very unique animal because of this very, very bizarre jaw morphology and the bizarre dentition. So this new pterosaur is nearly fully complete. I noticed that you said that there was a few bones missing. Uh, was it in the hand? We're missing the pteroids. We're missing the pteroids. So what was interesting was if it's nearly fully complete, so how do you think this animal would have died? I think it stopped breathing. <laughs> it's very difficult to determine the mode of death when a carcass has been preserved and it's in near perfect condition. I mean, if there was a nice big bite mark in the <laughs> middle of it and it had the jaw shape of an ichthyosaur, I would say that when it came down to land on the water, an ichthyosaur came up and, 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 and took it. But the specimen is just absolutely perfect. Uh, and so we could speculate as much as we like, uh, but until we actually find some smoking gun evidence, like a tooth embedded in the carcass or something like that, we really have no idea how it died. Um, you know, it could have been that it was in a shallow lagoon and there was a toxic algal bloom and, and it simply, you know, died like, like all those uh, animals die when there's a red tide on the west coast of Africa or something like that. Um, <clears throat> The skeleton is just absolutely perfect and it also doesn't seem to show any signs of decay. It looks as though it died and very, very quickly got buried, uh, which is also remarkable in itself because the skeleton is pneumatized and so the carcass likely would float for quite a while. Hmm. So I don't know why it didn't float. I don't know why it sank. <laughs> More stuff for research. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us here. I think. My pleasure. Can agree it's a really amazing pterosaur yeah, one of the, yeah, one of the most one of those amazing ones one of the most beautiful yeah. pterosaurs <laughs> ever rediscovered absolutely I mean, even the ct and x-ray scans those images were really nice as well yeah. the whole the whole thing is just an absolute delight to work on this yeah specimen. well thank you so much okay. um, and yeah thank you for answering our questions that's uh, cheers that's dave martell <laughs> If you'd like to see the full version of that interview, then do be sure to catch our upcoming episodes of Boneheads, where we'll be talking about this pterosaur in much more detail. Also in the news this week is a paper reporting on the discovery of 92 clutches of titanosaur eggs from central India, preserving a total of 256 individual eggs. Coming from an upper Cretaceous formation that is already well known for preserving fossil eggs from sauropod dinosaurs, these newly documented fossils enable an improved understanding of titanosaur reproductive biology. Various clutch patterns were observed, and six different egg species were recognised, likely showing a high diversity of titanosaur species in this region. Colonial nesting behaviour in these dinosaurs and a lack of parental care are also inferred from the fossils, consistent with what's been observed before. So another astonishing discovery of a giant dinosaur nesting site that adds some much needed data to our understanding of these amazing animals. Back to Doug in the studio. Are you sure I should... I'm under this metal fence. But hey, it's all in the name of science. <laughs>